Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Monday, August 19th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you on this episode. We take a look at some baseball news you should know. We seem to have a workload reduction plans in the cards for Paul Skeens, Tarek Skubal, a couple of very important starting pitchers. So we'll dig into the implications of that. We are going to talk about underperforming pitchers, the pitchers that have Missed the mark compared to their initial projections by the widest margins so far. We'll take a look at where the money went over the weekend and some moves that we made with our own clubs as well. You know how the weekend treats you? Pretty good. Yeah, we had I had a good time. I saw the new Alien movie on Friday night, <clears throat> and uh, it was fine. I mean, it was fine. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what people want, but it's like Alien Eight. You know, <laughs> all right, what not good? It's like. What did you what did you expect? At this point, it's like uh just going and seeing your buddies, you know, and like hanging out. Like we did at Alamo, which I actually love Alamo Draft House because it's it is like that. It's like you're seeing a a, a movie at the bar, you know. Good concept. Uh, saw some friends, had some beers, saw a movie. It was fine. Sounds like a <laughs> successful weekend. It's all you need. Yeah. Felix had uh my eldest had a good throwing session on Sunday with uh, some of his better velo and some of his better curveballs, And he's got fall ball coming up soon. So he was excited about that. Do you have him thrown in front of a, a radar? No, this is me guessing. <laughs> it's okay. Also, I got, I got a couple welts, you know, so I, you know, I can, I can judge the velo from the welts. <laughs> I think that's fair. I think until they did it in the old days. So it, it's a, it's a tested method. It's fair. Yeah. Uh, if you'd like to join our Discord, by the way, you can do that with the link in the show description. You can talk about movies, how much you loved Alien. You could ask sit-start questions. You could throw mailbag questions in there, too. All of those things are in play. Nice community we got growing over there. Let's get going with some news, though. Paul Skeens recently added to the list of pitchers who will have their workloads monitored. The good news is, based on people who've been uh, you know, briefed on the situation, I guess we'll say, they're not planning on shutting Paul Skeens down completely in Pittsburgh, but reducing his innings seems like something they're going to do on a start by start basis, which eventually causes some problems from a fantasy perspective, because if we're going three or four innings every start with guys like Skeens, we are very unlikely to get wins unless they throw an opener in front of them, which seems like something they would never do because it would only benefit us <laughs> and nobody else. But the other implications here, this is from a story that, Ken Rosenthal, Steven Nesbitt, and Zach Meisel wrote on The Athletic was that if the Pirates taper off the innings a lot or were to shut him down at some point, it could impact where he finishes in the National League Rookie of the Year voting and where he finishes in that voting would impact whether or not he gets a full year of service time this year. So the reasons why the Pirates would be more careful are a little more layered than just managing Paul Skeens' arm. That being said, I think they could shut him down today and he still might be first or second in the National League Rookie of the Year voting. I think so. Because he's been amazing. And I think voters would look past the delayed start to his season and the early ending, despite a fantastic rookie class in the National League. It's a loaded isn't class, that, as we've talked about before. Isn't that just a weird set of incentives? We we want him to win the rookie of the year or not be in the top three. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's not a great situation. Uh, so at this point, you're kind of screwed because I think no matter, I mean, screwed from a front office, we don't want to give him a full year of service time set of, set of you know, that, that set of incentives. You're screwed. He's a top three guy, you know? So at this point, you'd rather he won because <laughs> yeah. you want that pick. Uh, but then long term, there's there's a health discussion. I think that one thing that's sort of fascinating is, you know, I think Velo is one of the leading indicators. We Josh Kyle Cunell works for the Twins, put up an injury zone finder, and he was talking about velocity, release point consistency, zone percentages. And I think Velo is still the easiest way to kind of to spot a guy um, maybe in fatigue. And I just thought I'd uh, port over to Jordan, uh, Jordan Hicks's page real quick, just because I know he's not the same situation in terms of being a young guy that you're protecting in the same way, but 
if you were monitoring Jordan Hicks and saying we are monitoring for health reasons, we'll move him to the pen when you know when it seems like he's out of gas. I think there was tons of not even yellow flags, red flags, you know, for Hicks before they they pulled the plug. So he's sitting ninety six. Let's just call it ninety six. He's he's sitting ninety six for his first uh, seven starts. Then there's a ninety four. All right, all right, everything's fine. Ninety five, the next one. Then there's a ninety two. Okay, well maybe he was was that the game where he was sick or he was barfing or I don't know. 95, 95, 96, 93. Okay, what's going on here? You know, 95, 93, 95, 91. For me, he's out. You know, that's it. I I think I would have pulled the plug earlier. You just get 93s from a guy that started the season 96. Um, for them, I think Hicks is a veteran. And so there's a little bit of a like, can he still be good? You know, so there's that question. Paul Skeens. Started this started the year sitting 100, <laughs> but if we take that aside, that's like the the sort of you get a you get a you get a debut bump. Uh, he's been 99, and so he was 99 for six starts, and then he was 98, 99. Uh, last three starts, 98, 0, 97, 7, 97, 9. So he's down a tick. Um, I don't know. What, is that enough for you? No, because I, I think. The other information I would want is I'd want to see all starters and just what the tendency is. I mean, I think it's within the normal range of things we see to see a, a tick go over the course of the Velocity year. Velocity does tend to peak in August. Yeah, and sometimes guys get a little stronger and throw a little harder later in the year. Just sort of, I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Sometimes there's a mechanical fix. Sometimes your arm just feels better. You can't explain them all in one shot. I, I think the bigger question for the Pirates, and this is probably the way they've been thinking about it the whole time, is what do we need to do to keep Paul Skeens healthy while making sure he throws enough this year to have no restrictions or minimal restrictions in 2025? That's probably been the goal the entire time. And if he was good enough to win the Rookie of the Year within the bounds of whatever innings workload that allowed, fantastic, great. That's that's a win for us. If he wins it anyway, despite being a little lower in innings, oh well. Or if he comes close, well, you know, you did the best you could around the more important constraints. So I think it's easy to get caught up in those rules and think that that's the only thing a team cares about. But I'd be stunned if they were managing for those rules and incentives and not thinking about the big picture, given how good Skeens is and how important he is to their immediate and long term future. Yeah. And one thing that I like is that they're talking not about skipping starts um, because I just talked to Tarek Skubal about this. And Tarek Skubal is probably, you know, someone that you might be putting in a similar bucket, you know, mm -hmm. somebody that everybody cares about. Everybody has shares of everybody, you know, invested in his outcomes. He's maybe headed for the Cy Young, you know, so there's 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 personal hardware that's within grasp. Um, but his team also cares more about next year than they care about the Cy Young necessarily. Um, and so there's the same sort of complicated set of incentives. And uh, I was talking to him about, uh, you know, just skipping starts. He's like, I don't like that. He's like, I don't like, I don't even like that over the all-star break. Hmm. You know, he says, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, his first couple of games back from the all-star game is not the best baseball. You know, the hitters are, the hitters have taken time off and the pitchers have taken time off, you know? And uh, and there is science I've, I've quoted on the show before about how your body has adaptations uh, to high level athleticism. Your body adapts to, to be able to make those things possible and that those adaptations can go away on the day on three to five days. Like if you're if you're not requiring your body to sprint, you know, 100 meters in 10 seconds, you know, every you know, enough. Like if you, if you don't do it enough, you can't do it. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way that the sprinter going to the to to the Olympics takes doesn't sprint for a week before his his big sprint. Yeah, you know? yeah. they're they're going to be running a lot. <laughs> in yeah. probably a day off, maybe a day, two days off, maybe. Exactly. There's a plan in there, but it's not to completely rest for a full week. Oh, and, and now I'm going to run again. 
Yeah. So there's no, I, I don't think there's, there's much science that says that it'd be a good idea to skip starts. It's that's not what they're trying to do. Now we've been talking about this like six inning minimum idea. And part of why I hate it so much is because I think the best way is what they're talking about with skeins, which is maybe he's only going to go five. Maybe we'll only give him 80 innings. I mean, this is the part of the modern process of trying to keep young players healthy. And it's better for him to go out there and pitch us a, a shorter amount of pitches and a fewer pitches and short amount of innings than it is for him to skip it entirely. Yeah. And if he gets shut down completely at some point, yes, we do have off seasons that does, you could start the off season, but you don't want basically skipping a start is almost like starting the off season and restarting. <laughs> like you just don't want to do that. It's, it doesn't make sense. So uh, I would expect him um, to get like sort of 80, 85 pitches and be almost like uh, where Drew Rasmussen was at one point where like if he's super efficient, he can get the win still. You know, if he's not efficient that day, then he's going to go four and a third and be out. It's you knew with Paul Skeens that this was a risk and also that you weren't going to maybe get a ton of wins. Right. So it's it shouldn't affect too much of what you what you want out of him. The occasional win. Good ratios. Those are all still in there. I think what's really difficult to cope with is if you were relying on Garrett Crochet in the first half and you found, maybe on the waiver wire in a lot of cases, you found an ace and he pitched like one for the first three months of the season. The White Sox, I think, are doing something similar in that they're they're not just slamming the brakes and saying, take a month and a half off, take two months off. But they have not had Garrett Crochet face more than 18 batters since July 6th. He went four innings that day, faced 21 batters. But the game log since then, two, four, three, four, two and a third, and four for innings. Mm. So no chance at a win. 35 to 10 strikeout to walk ratio going back to July 6th. Gosh, is he droppable? I, it's so weird. It's like he's, it's almost he's like. not going to get you a win this way. It's more it's more of a workload than any real like reliever you're going to see. So you get those you get K's. It's a strikeouts play, but he mm -hmm. can't get wins. And then the ratios haven't been as good, in part because of one really bad outing against the Cubs, right? For the most part, he's still been pretty effective in those roles, in those limit in that limited role. But it is very hard in a league where you know five by five wins, 20% of your pitching points come from that category, and you've got that cannot get them because of the way they have to try and let him work without like overworking him. Yeah. And I think some of the, you know, people like I've had some questions. Oh, has the league figured him out? Because he had that seven game start against the Cubs, the seven inning, uh, seven earned run and two and a thirds innings start against the Cubs. Crochet did. And he had a five run, three earned run against Seattle. So he's had some bad starts. I think he's, I think he's got, um, a little bit of the Taj Bradley type package where it's very, very good fastball. He's going to figure out the pieces around it. The going to the cutter was good, but it has, he's still a two pitch pitcher and I'm not sure his second pitch, the cutter is as good as like, you know, a Spencer strider fastball slider combo. Mm -hmm. So he really needs to start reintroducing the slider back, you know, that he put away crochet does or, you know, we talked, I, I talked to him in length recently and we talked about the splitter and he's like, no, my elbow hurts when I throw that. So it's not going to be a splitter, but, um, you know, there's got to be another pitch, you know, maybe he can tweak that change up. Maybe there's something there where he adds, but even fastball cutter slider, like why not bring the slider back? You know, so I think there's, I think he'll be better next year. You know what I mean? Because you're he, he's gonna be thinking about starting. He's gonna have more innings in his back pocket. He's gonna be used to starting. He's gonna have an off season to to develop another pitch. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think how how you plan on drafting Crochet still depends on what happens in the final month and a half of the season. It's got to get through healthy, even with these reduced workloads. But let's assume three, four innings at a time for a while, maybe. Cuts down a week or two Finishes early. Finishes with like 150 innings. He was healthy yeah. all year. Ends probably with the similar stuff he has now. So 3-6 ERA, bunch of strikeouts. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm drafting him. I mean, I know a lot of people will be like injury red flag. So it will depend on sort of where he's available. And 
how much people are spending on him. But I think that a lot of people will be out because they'll just see, oh, yeah, he threw 150 innings, but he's never done that before. And he's been an oft injured guy. Like he's got to be, he's like the new Tyler Glass now, I guess, maybe. Oh, fun. Another polarizing ace that uh, everyone's going to fight about on the internet. I mean, of all the things to fight about on the internet, it's relatively small, but the the pricing, I think, is going to be high. I think there's going to be enough believers in Crochet. I guess the other the other question will be, is he actually going to get traded this offseason, or is he going to stay in Chicago and be part of their rebuild? Is he going to be on a bad team again next year? That's obviously a, a concern from a, a win perspective. But then, also like, like a player development, like who's going to help him get this new pitch? Yeah, a lot of pitchers take that in their own hands. We've talked mm-hmm. about on the show before, and like, look at what he did from the beginning of the season to the end of June: a three hundred two ERA. Those are the two thirty seven FIP underneath. I mean, that's like Cy Young stuff: a mm-hmm. one forty one to twenty strikeout to walk ratio and a hundred and one third innings. Like, you can dream on that. He could be pitcher one. It's literally the same thing I said about Glass now going into this season. It just comes back to health. Glass now is on the IL again hopefully for another relatively short stint. But nevertheless, like the pool of pitchers is packed with guys that throw really hard, have durability concerns either behind them or in Mm. front of them because of the characteristics that make them as effective as they are. Other than the fact that Crochet has been broken a bunch of times already. So that's it's even worse than Glasnow's injury history. I assume he's going to go inside the top 10 among starting pitchers which in NFBC style leagues and 15 team leagues means he's carrying an ADP inside the first three rounds. I think that's where Garrett Crochet is going to go. Skeens is going to go even earlier than that because Skeens does not have that injury history, right? He throws hard, has the future concern. We wonder how long it can work the way it's going to work. But no matter how you feel about the Pirates, you almost certainly think they're better than the White Sox are going to be in 2025. So you have to bake in a Crochet trade to make the team conducts better for a Crochet. And I think we've seen a level of consistency from Skeens that gives you just a little more confidence skills wise, even though Crochet has great skills. So I could see Skeens being maybe a top five starter by ADP going into 2025, but Crochet being in that next tier or sub tier right below him. You, I've, I've been, I lost my mind when you said throwing hard because there's been an update. Oh, that Dude. the list that we looked at last year around this time. Oh my god, the hardest throwing guys and how they were all hurt. And so here's 2023 minimum 50 innings pitched as a starting pitcher. Velocity sorted by fastball velocity. Bobby Miller hurt, un- ineffective, not the same as he was last year when he was led the league with 99 miles an hour. Hunter Green now hurt. Sandy Alcantara, Tommy John, Yuri Perez, Tommy John. Grayson Rodriguez has been the sort of bright and shining hope for most of the year, but he's hurt now. Spencer Strider, Tommy John, Shohei Otani, Tommy John, Shane McClanahan, Tommy John, Cole Reagan's been good so far this year. Jesus Luzardo, is it Tommy John? He got no. He got Luzardo was, I believe, a lat shoulder screen. or a lat. Let's see, yeah. back. I see back in the parentheses. That yeah. could always be lat though. Yeah. Forearm and shoulder strengthening. Uh, hurt most lumbar, of this year. lumbar stress reaction was the official <laughs> diagnosis hurt, hurt most of the season right mm-hmm. uh so that's that's the top 10 where i just had like what was like five tommy johns and everybody's been hurt this season and some previous tommy johns for some of those guys too i mean you mentioned mcclanahan you had tommy john before and it it, it, it c- continues i mean garrett cole's 11th um and you know he's he's hurt uh he, and he's come back but he's not exactly who he used to be. Luis Severino uh, is hurt all the time and is not who he used to be. Tyler Glass now has been hurt off and on this season. It's been a good season. I'm not I'm not I'm not trying to put him on the like oh he's been hurt all year but you know he throws really hard and that's what's Luis Castillo is like the only guy who seems like he can throw this hard and stay healthy and he's had that weird thing where he always doesn't throw hard at the beginning of the season and really sort of ramps up over the, over the course of the season. Once you start getting down to the top 20, it gets a little better. There's Luis L. Ortiz, Edward Cabrera has been hurt. George Kirby is healthy. Taj Bradley's been largely healthy. Luis Medina, Brandon Woodruff. So I don't know. I mean, it's is the is the real answer everyone gets hurt or is it 
um, that it's worse at the top here. It seems like it's worse at the top here. So if you'd resort this list for 2024, Skeens, Soriano, Hunter Green, Jared Jones, Garrett Crochet, Dylan Cease, Tarek Skubal, Luis Heedle, Logan Gilbert hit 100 in his last start. Tyler Glass now, Taj Bradley. I mean, maybe maybe I'm out. Greg, Garrett Crochet being like third in fastball velocity and having the injury history he has, that does not seem like that's a super solid bet for a lot of innings next year. Uh, but even like Reagan's, so like, think about where Cole Reagan's would have been if we were having this conversation a year ago, having just kind of broken back into the Royals rotation post trade, given his. So are we history. happy that Reagan's velo is down and he's only 25th in velo? Maybe we are. I don't know. 95, I mean, six could be just could be enough. He's been great. Yeah. A, a lot of guys in that 95 range. They've also been hurt too. Right. It doesn't get that much better. It doesn't get that much better. Like Zach Wheeler, I'll oh, hit Tommy John forever ago. Yeah. But then we're back in this you know, the Tommy John honeymoon. Is that is that still a thing that we really care about? Like it's such a. I yeah. tend to think that you, you we can't predict injuries that well, but but maybe the reddest of red flags should should really, you know, if they have an F health grade should be something you pay attention to C, you know what's funny is garrett cole had a c health grade on jeff zimmerman's health uh coming into the season partially because of velo yeah and i'm sure i was in that was like come on c that seems a little bit a lot harsh. of people were like your health grades are bad because there's no way garrett cole has a c <laughs> well if you're looking forward that's uh that's the grade you would want you don't necessarily need the looking back grade like that's yeah that's already there that's why fastball velo is one of the things that is in jeff zimmerman's health grades yeah, so I guess I don't know. We're shot. Are we shopping in the Tanner Bybee, Freddie Peralta? We know Freddie reaches back and gets a few extra ticks, sort of when he needs uh, it. Which he's is been, he's been hurt, but he, well, he's been hurt in the past. He's been healthy so far. Kirby, really good command, ninety-five nine. Like that seems like a good spot. He's he's up a little bit this year. He's eighth in fastball velocity among qualified starters on four seamers right wow, now. Wow, yeah, but don't do the qualify. That's, that's don't do qualify. Yeah. It's just There's what no happened to be qualified me. starters. Yeah, there are there are Luis, no qualified Luis Castillo, starters. Castillo, ninety-five six, twenty-seventh. You know that seems fine, but you can't you can't just be like, oh well, if they're ninety-five, they're fine because Carlos Rodon has ninety-five-five, and I, no one's going to give him a good health grade. No, no, you can't. I, yeah, I, it's just his. Whole I tend to actually think life that has been that way. Grayson Rodriguez, you know, being fifteenth on the list here with a ninety-six-one, like. I still like Grayson Rodriguez. Grayson Rodriguez is probably going to be a little bit higher on my list next season than than a lot of other people's lists. I think I'm going to sign up for a draft during first pitch Arizona. I want because I, I just like drafting early. I just like having one where I sit down. I don't know, dude. Hold it. It's such low information. It's it's so bad. Like all of my draft and holds that I did the the first one that the first draft and hold I did. I only am starting my my healthy pitchers. I have no I have no bench healthy pitchers. Is that the one that I I jumped in and then you just you, you clicked in it too and we're like we're in the same league. This isn't great. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I'm in. I think I. Where am I in that one? It's not good. I think you're at eleventh right now. It looks like oh Chef Mike, Michael uh, Armstrong, but... atop that lead. Maybe he's oh, yeah. gonna run away with it. I'm in 11th in the first one I took. I'm in seventh in the second one I took, and I'm third in the in the last draft champions I did, which makes all the sense in the world to me. I don't know. I think you, I think you have more of an edge drafting early than you do late because of the things that make drafting early hard work against everyone. And I think you and I and many other people that get to do this full time have the benefit of time on our side research early prep that a lot of other folks don't necessarily have the luxury of baking in that's possible and i think you know if there was a, a change to my strategy if there's something that i kind of learned from that first one i think was that i did not emphasize um a health pitcher health enough so like i said i have i actually do have one healthy uh guy on the bench right now it's paul blackburn at san diego but i'm you know i've been playing trevor rogers like all year in this league because everyone's been hurt yeah so i think it, i think early in the off season if you're drafting you should actually care a lot about health 
I think you should, I don't know how much we are very good at predicting it, but if you can build yourself the safest, most boring uh, draft and hold in October, do it. Just the just guys who were not even that good, maybe. <laughs> they just seem like they're going to be healthy next year. <laughs> Oatmeal October brought to you by Better Oats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I highly recommend that if you're going to be uh, drafting that early. That is a great wrinkle to include. Let's get to one other injury thing before we move on to a broader topic. I just happened to notice this digging around, looking for some updates. Cabrian Hayes has been playing through a herniated disc for most of the season. This is according to a report from Jason Mackey in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I read that and I thought, well, that explains literally everything about mm. Kibrian Hayes' season. And it's not its not even that like what he was doing in the second half of last year had to necessarily translate into a full season of production that looked like that. It's that he was a league average hitter over the course of all of last season, and he's among the worst qualified hitters in baseball this year. And that doesn't make sense because even as he was trying to figure it out in 21 and 22, he, he was, was within decent. you know 10 or 15% of league average and playing great defense. And even his defense, I think grades even out a little defenses, worse this year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you can tell like it's, it's had a major impact on him. I, I was reading some of the quotes. You could also tell that as a guy that signed a contract extension there, he wants to be out there every day, but playing every day, herniated disc isn't going to get better. It's just, it's not going to get better until you rest. So it made me think that there might actually be a rebound coming from Cabrian Hayes, health permitting. I just don't know if I want to bet on this kind of health problem being mm. okay in the long run, like even if it's okay for a little while. Because like uh, we just had another one with um, with Christian Yelich, right? Like, Yeah, and it was kind of an ongoing thing where it, I don't know if it ever... It's hard to know. Like Yelich, I feel like a lot of times Yelich doesn't give great quotes. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not in nature to give a but lot we of But we know that the back has been hurting him for a while, and we know yeah. that he's having surgery on it now, and that he sort of put it off for a while. So right. we, I think I would rather hear about surgery. for. I, I would rather they shut him down soon and hear about surgery. That's, what's, that's what I'm hoping for. I did trade for him, Springer for him, in a 20-team dynasty. And I, I don't actually – this news doesn't actually make me feel that much worse because, okay, there's an explanation for this year. And what I'm hoping for is some sort of, you know, cleaning this up, you know, doing something about it and uh, a chance for some some rebirth next year. I'm dropping him in every other league. Yeah. Like, I don't feel that badly about trading for him in a Dan dynasty because, you know, this is a deep ass dynasty. If he can get back to 320 OBP and hit 10 homers and t- steal 10 bases next year, then I think I did the right thing. Yeah, I finally got to the point this weekend in uh, Tout Wars, 15-team league with unlimited IL spots. So it ends up playing more like a, I don't know, 17, 18-team league, probably with all the injury stashes. Because you can't, there's not that much on the wire because everyone's just stashing there, yeah. I finally cut Cabrian Hayes from that team because he's not on the IL, so I can't stash him. And you have to I, play him. I didn't want to play him. I just I didn't want to. I, I splashed a big bid in there on junior Caminero and felt like I uh, maybe won the lottery, even though it, I don't know if I'm going to catch Jeff Pontus and, and Ray Flowers at the top of the table. Ryan Boyer's up there too, but Caminero is playing. I mean, I, mean, I, I was fantastic. a little bit worried about playing time, but he's playing. Yeah. Playing yeah. every day. Basically their everyday third baseman. I think they're making the right call. I think they're just it doesn't, ready. It doesn't look that terrible. I've seen some terrible at bats from him, but Overall, it's it's pretty good. I mean, he's taking walks. He's hitting the ball hard. I mean, it's what you, it's what you wanted. Yeah. Felt like I got a massive upgrade when I won that bid <laughs> over the weekend just because of how much Hayes has struggled. But I'm glad we have a reason now. At least it makes some sense that you take this much of a step back after what looked like a pretty nice growth year for him in 2023. So last week, we talked about underperforming hitters, the players that were furthest away from projections so far with seven weeks to go in the season. We're going to do the same exercise today with pitchers. And there's one name that just jumps off the page right away. It's Pablo Lopez. He's still here. He's come up on the show a couple of times this year. And I think every time he comes into the conversation, it's usually in the form of a mailbag question or someone saying, Hey, like what's, what's really going on with Pablo Lopez? What's actually different. And every time I've looked into it, all I see is a higher home run rate 
than we've ever seen from Pablo Lopez before. And I don't see anything else underneath it that makes me believe that stuff's changed in a way where he can't be the Pablo Lopez that we've seen you know, going back to his last couple of seasons, his last year in Miami and his first year in Minnesota. I think he can be a mid threes ERA, good whip, strikeout per inning pitcher again. Like I was a little bit of a Lopez skeptic at price on draft day, but now I feel like I'm going to have a lot of Pablo Lopez on my teams in 2025. Yeah, I think he probably there will be an overcorrection. Um, you know, for his career, he has a 1.1 home runs per nine, and this year he has 1.4. Um, all of his strikeout and walk rates are pretty much uh, in line or better than his career rates. 3.72 uh, career Sierra for Pablo Lopez, 3.45 this year. Um, you know, that's that's as good as anything. I mean, K minus BB and Sierra are very strong uh predictive numbers um in, in this type of sample. So um I think that's the basis. I I have talked to him and I have seen in the numbers that the four seam is acting a little differently this year. It's lost some ride, it's added some uh horizontal in a way that I don't think he wants necessarily. Um, and the curveball has been a little bit different too, where um, it's added more drop than it's ever had. And I, I don't really know if that's what he wants uh, because there's a velocity component. He was throwing a little bit harder last year, the curveball. Uh, but I would notice, I would, I would point out that in terms of fastball velocity and vertical movement um, on the four seam, and the curveball. So velocity and vertical movement on the forcing the curveball, there has been some improvement um, in August. And, you know, I'm not looking at his game log right now, so I don't know uh, if he's been great uh, because I, for me, he's been kind of a guy I just stick out there. But he said, uh, it was a pretty notable quote that I liked. Um, uh, he said that he's, he's trying to find things in his base that he can, that he can optimize and make better because he doesn't really want to fool around. He thinks that's too late at release and all that. That's too late. It's, mm. it's gotta be something else. That's, that's set, setting all this up. So he, uh, his most recent tweak is a mini twerk. So he like does this like weird little thing with his butt. He does like a little mini twerk with his butt before he pitches. So and he's like so, loading, like doing like a muscle yeah, load with it's his It's like butt. a little preload. Yeah. It's like a little preload where he kind of just like shifts what his pelvis is doing. It's, but he's like little twerk and he did it. And I was like, yeah, it's kind of looks like a little bit of a twerk. <laughs> 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 so, uh, you know, that's, that's a fun little thing. The velo is up and, um, you know, now I can look at his uh, game log real quick and see how he's been recently. Yeah, I mean, uh, the last two starts have been really good. He has, if it's, if your stinker is five um, innings against the Cubs and four earned runs, and then otherwise you've been great um, since the July fifth. Like, let me let me just do the a quick game long thing. I, I know this is such arbitrary endpoints. Oh, he had a bad start on. July 3rd, so July 5th on. <laughs> oh, I counted the July 5th start. He's got a 364 ERA in his last eight starts, even counting that outing against the Astros. He looks more like himself. K's are down a little bit during that span, but there's some reasonably tough matchups kind of sprinkled in there that may have tempered that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the Mets offense is decent. He was in New York, though. Um, the Royals offense is decent. Texas is decent. Cubs, are, these are not, you know, the worst offenses. Some of them are not great. He, you know, he did well against Milwaukee. Um, yeah, from 7-6 on, 2-7-9 ERA, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> amazing. Uh, but uh, also a 95-2 on the four seam. So uh, that's a better number than he has for the season. And I think it's an indication of, you know, somewhat to some extent, the, uh, the tweak uh, having some effect. So, uh, you know, he, I don't know if he'll win a Cy Young. Maybe last year will be the, the highest he gets in terms of Cy Youngs. Um, but he's a really good pitcher. Uh, he's That's the best way to sum them up. <laughs> it's just you know, but uh, well, who put up that list again? The biggest underperforming pitchers because some of them, some people, they weren't listening. They were they're listening. So it's Canning, Lopez, Michaelis, Savali, Arigetti, Peralta, Gossman, Freddie Peralta, Kevin Gossman, Carlos Carrasco, Brian Bayo, 
Carlos Rodon, Max Fried, Frankie Montas, Trevor Rogers, Chris Flex, and Zach Eflin. So I think there's a lot of ones on here that if you're listening to the show, you weren't in on. I don't think we told you guys to get canning. Uh, Michaelis was projected uh, to be bad and was worse. You know, <laughs> So I don't think a lot of people sign up for that. Uh, so Eric Getty, we've talked about a lot. Um, and I tend to think it's actually just the wildness that I, that I think is hurting him. Um, I think it's lack of command. And so I don't, I, I hesitate to say he's going to be as good as a strikeout red says he'll be, but uh, I don't think his fate is, is, is written down in stone yet. It's also more of a, it's probably a shorter sample than some of the other guys. Aaron Savali, uh, he's been pitching better recently and um, I don't know what to say about him. It's not a good fastball. I don't, you know, there's definitely a lot of bad fastballs on this list. Uh, you know, and um, and again, Montas, Rogers, and Flex, and nobody was really in on them. Uh, nobody really got was pain there. But um, I do think the most interesting names are Pablo Lopez, Freddie Peralta, and Kevin Gossman. Maybe to some extent Carlos Rodon, but I just think I think that's a really tough park. I think he's been pitching fine, you know. Um, but um, Gossman, I did look this up and. Just after I said, Kevin Gossman is a good buy low. Um, <laughs> Kevin Gossman did this. So uh, his fastball stuff plus in March and April was a 101, which is good because I uh, averaged around 97. In May, his fastball uh, was 98 stuff plus. In June, it had a little resurgence to 103. And then in July, 98. And in August, he has an 89 stuff plus on his four seamer. His overall stuff plus is 82. This is the worst it's ever been. He's in a decline and it's, it ports over directly to a decline in strikeout rate that you can just sort of graph over time and be like, wow, it's not something that happened all at once. He has been losing strikeout rate since his peak mid season last year. It's been going down. So I tend to think this is just what it looks like to age. I think uh, I'm not sure that he's going to return to uh, top elite status for me. Yeah, I don't know if he comes back to elite. Maybe he can bounce back partially. Yeah, maybe he comes back to a 3 8 ERA. Its projections have him kind of in that range. The bat's mm-hmm. the most skeptical down at 438 and a 124. If you're looking over at fan graphs, the bat suggest maybe it gets a little bit worse from a, an ERA perspective. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the massive drop in strikeout rate, uh, swing strike rates come down with it. And it started to come down last year. The swing strike rate was the one thing you could see alongside the K rate, where even though he was still missing a lot of bats, getting a lot of guys to punch out, he was not getting as many swings and misses. So that was maybe the first little yellow flag that something could be changing. I'm surprised he lost this much this quickly. But that being said, it is aging. And it's and he's 33 already. So, yeah, it, it comes quick sometimes. Well, little side note, you mentioned but the bat's the most negative. The bat's the most negative on almost every pitcher. And what I yeah. noticed, I used the bat for this, this uh, activity, and the median difference between projection and reality is minus 0.4. So the bat's projected run environment was 0.4 runs of ERA too high. Mm. And considering that we're still seeing this, I'm wondering if maybe the run environment hasn't been adjusted over the season. Because if you take 0.4 off of Kevin Gossman's the bat projection, he gets way more in line with everybody else. Yeah, it's still higher, but it's a 3.9 instead of a 4.3. Yeah, so I don't know exactly. Uh, I, sh- I, c- I could, I- I'm, I'll try to ask uh, Derek about this because we, we chat fairly often, but. Um, it was something I noticed. So, so that's another thing. When you look at that, um, you know, that list of underperforming pitchers, when you say, oh, well, he was projected for, you know, Kevin Goss was projected for 3.8 and he has a 4.02 or whatever he has or 4.1. Four, what does he have? What's four, he projected two. for? Yeah. He he's a, got a 4.2 right now. He was projected around for like 3.8 going into the season or something, 3.7 going into the season. He has a 4.2. That's a worse difference than you than you might at first think because the three seven or three eight projection that Kevin Gossman had was already 0.4 runs too high for the run environment. Hmm. So really he was projected for three, four in this run environment. 
and gave you a four two. So um, anyway, that was a little sidebar that has to do with projections and run environments. But uh, what about Peralta? I mean, I think we both love him, and I keep putting him like in my top fifteen, top twenty. And he's got the strikeout rate. The velo is good. Um, but it is now 300 innings of a 1.4 home runs per nine. Yeah. I think that's, I think that to me is explained in part by how he misses. I think his misses are more catastrophic misses a lot of times. <laughs> so I do think that's something that's a little bit like baked into his approach and his pitch mix. It's purely observational, it's not a data supported argument. Um, so I do think he's the kind of pitcher that runs a higher home run rate than, say, Pablo Lopez, right? And I know for a lot of his career being in Miami, the home ballpark was also a factor that helped Pablo Lopez keep that number down. Where I think I have a little bit of optimism, though, is that I think there are things Freddie Peralta has done over time that show a pretty nice evolution for him as a pitcher, right? Like the the usage of Adding breaking pitches. it off speed stuff. Yeah, yeah. like the, the way he approaches hitters is a lot better than when he came into the league, which is true of many pitchers. Like we've seen the kind of growth we want to see, and he still misses a lot of bats. So you take mm-hmm. the chance on, on guys that strike out 28, 30% of the batters they face as a starter, you take the warts. The only thing that's a little bit tricky with Peralta is that his walk rate isn't great it's not horrible it's not double digits doesn't jump off the page like a like a dylan cease walk right it's below average command but it's not it's not terrible command right it's just like one thing needs to be tweaked for peralta to have that year like i think if you read the baseball forecaster at least once maybe even more than once now he's been one of those guys that has the upside you know 200 k's three era and he's done the 200 k's if he's ever going to do a three era as a full season starter it's probably because the home run rate comes down because he got lucky or because he commands the ball a little better and brings the walk rate down. One of those things probably has to happen. If he keeps walking guys at close to a 9% clip where he's been for his career and he keeps struggling with the long ball, what you see is probably what you get. Or the ratios you saw in 23, a 386 ERA and a 112, that's as good as it's ever going to get unless he's able to make those adjustments. But that's fine because the thing that Freddie Peralta has also done much like Pablo Lopez, as he's now putting together two mostly healthy seasons. You said 300 innings over the last two years. Like, that's great. For a long time, Lopez had that same kind of concern. Well, it's it's good when he's out there, but he's had some arm injuries. Same has been true of Freddie. But if he gets through the rest of the season without any sort of hiccup in, in the form of an arm injury, I think you start to see a more encouraging workload grade on Freddie Peralta going into 2025. Yeah, and I, I also think this is a great place to go shopping is uh, someone who strikes out a lot of people and doesn't walk that many people and um, and gives up too many homers. If you just look at people who have cut their home run rate big time this year, um, which, uh, I, you know, it's a little bit different if you're talking Dynasty because you kind of want them for multiple seasons. And so if they do have a home run flaw, then – you know, you don't, you don't care that much if like, oh, one of those three seasons was a Cy Young season if you have to roster him for all four seasons to get that. But in a, in a year-to-year thing, any player that strikes out a lot of people and doesn't walk a lot of people and has a home run rate has the chance to just have a career year. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at the home run improvers this year, there's a lot of sort of pop-up guys. Brandon Fott's on this list. Christopher Sanchez probably actually has... Uh, home run suppression as a skill. Um, but uh, Hunter Green is on this list. Brian Wu is on this list. Ronel Blanco is on this list. Um, you know, Reese Olsen, Taj Bradley. Um, you know, a lot of these guys are guys that you could have bought at a cheaper price in an auction or wherever um, because people thought maybe they had a home run issue and then they cut it. So, the, the, you know, with him, it's a little bit more established because 300 innings, but it is still only 300 innings over two seasons. So we don't even actually know exactly what his, his true talent home run rate is. My other question when it comes to Freddie Peralta. Yeah, yeah, it's still like not quite there. We're kind of honing in on what we think it should be, but it's not like clear to us just yet because that work goes a little on the smaller side. I look at the the percentile uh, rankings, the sliders, the popsicles, as people call them. 
on Chase and whiff. And I see, you know, Freddie gets a lot of whiffs. Like, that's clear. You can see that when you watch him. He doesn't get as much chase as you'd think. But I think that speaks to that's the... That's a command stat, I It's think. the command thing, right? It's like it's missing in a non-competitive way. It's it's Or or being occasionally predictable. I think it's more the former than the latter. I think He it's misses middle-middle middle sometimes. Misses. Yeah. He get, I think he gets away with some of those middle-middle middle misses, too. Just as he throws up some home runs on, on those misses. Well, because a lot of times it would be 95, 96. And yeah. Yeah. With that extendo ball that he throws. Do you think at this point, though that what we see is what we get for chase because I think he's been below 50th percentile in chase every year since 2021. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think he has good, great command. And I think it, uh, you know, one thing that Nick Pollock, you know, brings up a lot about him is about Freddie Peralta is that he's a little bit cross body. Mm. So if you do want to kind of watch out for this on a mechanical level, I think it's possible that being cross body is, is tough on, on it. The, the biggest sort of cross body guy that I, that I always think of is Jake Arrieta. Um, and he did have some good seasons where he cut and he had good walk rates, but I do wonder what his location pluses were because he came into the league with the walk problem, you know, and left with a, with a poor walk rate. And so I wonder, you know, you just figure out how to miss in the middle or what it was, but you know, he was, he was a little bit uh, up and down over his career. And, and so maybe, maybe Nick is right that, you know, these cross body guys. And what I mean by that is like you kind of your foot lands, you know, in a place like watch Adam Adovino too. Mm-hmm. your foot lands in a place that you're sort of throwing over your foot. Like almost like, is there a good way to describe that? Like, you know what I mean? Coming over your plant leg. Yeah, you're coming over your plant leg. Yeah, yeah, that it's you can just think about it like mechanically. Yeah. It, it's it's a little bit weird. You you would seemingly fall off balance more easily. I mean, because you're comfortable with it. It's I know that's not true, but it's it just seems like you're creating something to trip over almost. Mm-hmm. You're you're putting more pressure on your plant leg and your mechanics to be true when you're. Like, like it's the worst example I can think of something that would just fell off was uh Willie Peralta back in the day, extreme mm. fall off towards first base. Like I wondered like, how could you ever command anything like that? <laughs> but one last thought here, Arietta got away with some kind of improved walk rate for exactly two seasons where he went from guy that was kind of in the high sevens, low eight range. He was in double digits earlier in his career got down under 7% for those two amazing years with the Cubs. Mm-hmm. And as age 28 and 29, I just wonder, like, is there a peak age for command? Mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've seen probably a similar amount of Freddie in the big leagues that we saw of Arietta up to that point in their respective careers, maybe a slightly higher workload for Freddie. But I, I don't know. Like, are we, are we comfortable saying that as a, as a command grade or as a as command score, like, we wouldn't want to project more on a pitcher once we've seen X number of innings or once they've reached a certain age. Yeah. Um, BB uh, per nine looks like it does peak. Uh, the aging curves that Bill Petty did are from 2012. So it's a little bit old now, but um, it does look like they kind of, they peak definitely later than uh, strikeout rates and later than velocity. Um, and it does look kind of like 28, 29. So that might be your other exception to the, okay, like I'm going to take a chance on these guys up until they turn 30. Like Dylan Cease is in that right now. He's 28 and mm-hmm. having the best walk rate season of his career, 8.5%. I mean, it's. Yeah. But what's he going to look like in three years? That is an interesting question. Right. But maybe it was a very smart idea to be all i mean once you get traded to san diego it changed a lot about how much we like the team contacts the home park a lot of things were different yeah he's been consistently i think in my top 15 all year so yeah but i think maybe there is that one extra level freddie can reach there's just a couple different things that have to happen if he's going to get there let's take a look at where the money went this weekend uh, kind of a funny group of bids of course uh, zebby matthews was popular in the many leagues where he was available we discussed him a lot last week he's got a two-step coming through this week too so it'll be fun to see how that plays out at the Padres 
and home against the Cardinals. But I saw some interest in Matthew Boyd, who is back and part of that Guardians rotation. He pitched well against the Cubs in his first start of 2024. Six Ks, no walks, five and a third innings, one earned run. And he's got a two-step. I had no interest in Matthew Boyd this season <laughs> because the first start is at the Yankees. And I don't want to even, no. even in a league where my ratios are banged up. And there's a few of those. I didn't think it was going to be worth the risk to take that first start in order to get one home against Texas that might be kind of closer to average in terms of difficulty right now. He's he's done pretty well, um, you know, with poor stuff plus numbers in the past. Um, but, you know, for his career, 492 ERA and a 132 whip is not someone that I'm sort of reaching for to, to, to go into Yankee Stadium. Um, one little note, on um on on stuff plus so one of the things that we are going to do is uh maybe adjust a little bit for left-handers and give them some credit because what we did do this last off season was in terms of stuff we told the machine when it was a same-handed um interaction like we told the machine this is same-handed this is opposite-handed in order to get at the idea that some shapes are be- like a sweeper Mm-hmm. You know, and that reduced some of the stuff plus on sweepers because you're like, oh, well, you can't really throw them to as a righty to lefties because they'll, they'll beat you up. And so we thought I thought that would capture a lot of it. What, what uh, we what some people found recently, Matan K on, on Twitter found recently was that if you just graph stuff plus for left handers and right handers, the graphs don't line up. Mm. And um so it's possible that left-handers are still being undervalued a little bit. And I think the source of it is there are just fewer left-handers. So it, you just see them less often. So they get a little bit of that sort of scarcity boost, you know? So uh, plenty of models just put their finger on the scale. We haven't done that yet, but I think we will to just sort of make those two graphs line up, you know, in, in some sort of adjustment. So that's probably part of uh, uh, what's probably going to be a, a fairly major adjustment to stuff plus this off season um, that uh, it looks like Max Bay and I are going to present at first pitch. Very cool. Yeah. And if you hadn't, haven't signed up already, you can do that at baseballhq.com. Join us in the desert October 31st through November 3rd. Always a good time watching fall league games, presentations, just hanging out, talking baseball, drafting teams. If you want to, if you like drafting teams in November, you can do it. We'll have a live pod while we're there, I believe, as well. So Boyd is, to me, sort of like just the guy for now. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens down the stretch. He could end up being important for the Guardians. Like That's possible just based on the way that rotation is built right now and has had a couple guys like Tristan McKenzie uh, really underperform and create this sort of void for at least a, a playoff caliber starter to possibly emerge for this team. Yeah, um, you know, the slider, despite the stuff numbers, I think is a pretty good pitch. And he's he's always been sort of pushing the slider ahead. So, you know, I think that Cleveland needs Matthew Boyd more than our fancy teams did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had uh, somebody like Luis L. Ortiz uh, ahead of him, uh, who's got a two-step. Um, I forget what my exact two-step rankings were. Maybe if I do my FAB results, it'll show me really quickly. Um, because... No, it's just going to show you who you won. It's not going to show you who you bid on. Oh, uh, wait. Anyway, I got, uh, I got, you know, I got Luis L. Ortiz in that league. And then I think another two starter was Joey Estes. I had Joey Estes ahead of Matt Boyd. Joey Estes has two starts at home against uh, Tampa. And I forget who the second start is, but he's home all week. So, yeah. It, it, he's got good command. He's got, he's got a decent slider. I think they're probably more similar than you'd like them to be. I, I thought Martin Perez also had a two step both at Petco. He's got a twenty one to three strikeout to walk ratio. Yeah, his last strikeout rate start. has really jumped uh, with uh, with with uh, San Diego. What is he doing differently? Well, last three starts were against the Pirates, Marlins, and Rockies. So <laughs> that might help a little. I mean, that's. I, I think he may have tweaked something also, like in terms of pitch mix, but the schedule has helped. Yeah. Let me see. Partial seasons, pitches. Uh, he is throwing his sinker less. Oh, he's just throwing his sinker less and throws his curveball more. Yeah. 
He's just throwing fewer fastballs. There you go. That was kind of fun. What about, uh, he doesn't have two this week. He's only got one. Osvaldo Beto, home matchup against the Rays. 17 to 6 strikeout to walk ratio over 18 innings in his last three starts. Got a couple of wins sprinkled in there as well. Uh, Found back end useful starter in Oakland or someone who's just running a little bit hot right now? I mean, the pitch mix change here is replacing sinkers with cutters. Uh, so that must be what he's doing against left-handers instead of, or instead of, to right. I don't know, he's got a four-seam cutter. He's really reduced the sinker. He's increased uh, the changeup usage. Um, Stuff Plus says, amazingly, that he's got two above-average fastballs, maybe even three. Uh, with a plus slider. Wow. That's pretty good. I had him on my trees, so I, I had been looking at him, but I did not think um, that would be true, that he had that in pitch mix. Um, so uh, anyway, I, I would say that he's definitely a home home start. I would definitely start him at home. I'd be a little bit nervous about starting him on the road until I got a little bit more information about how he's getting lefties out. He was cheap. Single digits in even 15 team leagues for me this weekend. So I, I felt it was just worth the risk because if I don't like what I see against the Rays or if I like something better this coming weekend, move on and just kind of let someone else decide if it's all going to work. But yeah, multiple fastballs that are good in a slider. Like I think there could actually be a little something there for Beto. Good. uh, I got, uh, I got uh, uh, pretty excited about this. I got Jace young in three leagues and in one of my leagues is a main event league where I have $50 out of a thousand left <laughs> for the rest of the season. And we didn't, we were thinking about maybe just taking the whole week off. And I said, you know what? Why don't I just put a dollar on all the kind of dollar or two on all the hot bids this week? Like what if people forget about Zebby Matthews and we just get Zebby Matthews for $2. And so we got Jace Young for $2 because I was like, you know, somebody's going to bid more than this and nobody did. <laughs> and I don't really know why because he looks pretty solid in terms of walks, strikeouts, max EV, hard hit rate, in AAA, power. I think they're just going to play him. I mean, are people really worried that they wouldn't play him? But they're, why would they call him up and not play him? So I, I don't understand. Um, I have him, uh, you know, I, I did look and see that Rasball has him projected in the 200s. So maybe it's just that projections are bad but you have to remember that projections are going to be bad for every rookie and his projections are not even actually that bad like zips has him with a 97 wrc plus for a rookie that's pretty impressive uh because you know the way that projections works is they're gonna they're gonna regress all rookies down to rookies what rookies usually do not league average they're gonna regress into what rookies usually do so i think you know i think the rookie average is like 80 wrc plus because there's a lot of people who come up and aren't any good um but i think he's gonna be good so i i'm happy with him he's been playing uh and he's they just gave him third base and they sent justin henry malloy down and jay sung is gonna get a shot so i'm really i'm really happy that i got him in uh, even though i in tgfbi and this is so annoying i paid 31 dollars and nobody else put a bid on him and that annoys me but uh, otherwise, uh, Sir Anthony Dominguez, and Michael Kopech were big wins, uh, big wins for people. Uh, I think they're both the closers for their teams. And I'm just happy that in, a, in my main event, I had Kopech ahead of time. Um, and in a lot of places, I've had Kopech for a while. And I think I've, I hope I've been telling you guys. Yeah. Have I, have I been telling people? To get Kopech? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Okay. I hope so. Sir Anthony Dominguez. Um, I think that, you know, they just got three guys with plus stuff and we're just hoping one of them wouldn't be as wild as normal. And it's Sir Anthony Dominguez. What's amazing, though, is uh, Craig Kimbrell does not have a save since July 7th. Dude, it's August 19th. Like, (laughs) it's a long time to go without getting a save. I mean, I'll draft him as my third closer next year, just hoping to get 15, 20 saves out of him in the first half and knowing that I'll probably drop him at some point because this is not the first time he's had this type of year. Not at all. I mean, that seems almost to be what he does now. Yeah. Yeah, it's 
fades fades late um i think it's interesting too with sir anthony dominguez we're seeing an improved walk rate this year i mean that's always been a, a lingering flaw for him i'm really interested to see if there's anything else the orioles change about him home runs been a problem you know throughout the year both stops so far but i think the park will help reduce the concerns about that with dominguez too so there's a chance that He's the guy for the rest of the year. Felix Bautista comes back next year, and he'll be their closer for 2025, assuming no hiccups. But uh, at least for the short term, that was a pretty inexpensive bid. There was one league uh, I partner up with our buddy JH. 15-14 was the winning bid on Dominguez with Kelvin Fauche as the drop. And I thought, that's great because the Orioles win a lot more than the Marlins do. And I like Dominguez's skills a bit more than Kelvin Fauche's as well. So a little bit of a nudge in both directions there. Anybody else you're excited to get this weekend? Uh, in one league, I just revamped my entire bench uh, in one fell swoop, uh, getting Jace Young dropping Addison Barger. Uh, he's just not playing. Yeah. You know, he's kind of playing against lefties, I think. Uh, he's not playing enough. Uh, and I d- picked up Will Wagner dropping Dylan Moore. The the I think that J.P. Crawford is getting closer to coming home, and I just noticed that they've they've got somebody they're playing over Dylan Moore at shortstop. So Dylan Moore is not necessarily uh, playing every day anymore. Um, and he's not playing at shortstop. I thought they would just install him at shortstop, and that has not been the case. So um, I picked up Will Wagner for Dylan Moore, uh, just hoping for some batting average, really. Will Wagner is uh, the son of Billy Wagner. He's 26 years old. And I think the reason he has taken so long to get here is that if you take his WRC plus and adjust it for his age, you get a lot closer to 100. So in 2024, if he's at AAA with Houston with a 122 WRC plus at 24, you might I think you might actually adjust that down 20 points to basically league average because hmm. um, it's he's a little bit on the older side. Uh, so. 26 years old, though, at the flip side of that is he's in his peak age range. So this is going to, you know, athletically and in terms of baseball skills, this should be the best time of his life. And the one of the reasons why I like picking him up is he makes contact. So I, I don't know what the true talent power is. That's been all over the place. But he makes contact, has a decent approach at the plate. Um, you know, I'm this is a hits play for me. You know, when I put him in, I'm looking for some weak offenses um, putting him in a, a sort of backup MI position. And the last one that I uh, did was Ramon Laureano dropping Mitch Hanniger. Mitch Hanniger is just dealing uh, with some some nagging injuries. And uh, I saw Ramon, and and uh, it's always a pleasure to see him. He says, uh, put me in the lineup every day and everything's going to be fine. <laughs> of course, every player says that. Uh, but he said that one of the things that was t- tough in Cleveland was the sporadic playing time. He's been playing, uh, you know, very often in Atlanta. It's a nice home park for home runs. Uh, he's got the best barrel rate of his career. Uh, and um, I think it's not going to give me a lot in batting average, but I'm hoping three, four homers and a couple stolen bases. I mean, that's that's what you're looking for at this point in the season. So those are some deep league guys. I think all of them, although Jace Young, I think is pick upable in any league. In if you have that sort of spot where it's like I'm trying to catch lightning in a bottle, you know, if you don't necessarily have to like pick him up and start him in your ten teamer, then yeah, put him on your bench in a ten teamer. I had to pick up Gavin Lux in a twelve teamer inexpensively. Had to drop Jordan Westberg. We still don't have a timetable for him to come back from that hand injury, but just needed an MI eligible player to have at the ready. And uh, I just wanted to bring it up because I figured now that I have Gavin Lux on another roster. There's a very good chance that the heater he's been on, kind of going back to early July, will come to a screeching halt because I have been a long-term believer in Gavin Lux, and much like my uh, faded belief in Victor Robles, I, I just like I can't benefit from this. Like this looks like a completely different player, though. If you go back to July 1st, 311, 384, 541 for Gavin Lux, six homers during that span. That's the Gavin Lux I was hoping for That's three years ago. Increased bat speed guy. Yeah, more bat speed and playing in prominent spots in that lineup. I mean, look at where he's been hitting the last, geez, three-ish weeks now, between third and fifth in the Dodgers lineup. Who saw that coming? I gave up on it. This so, is why they didn't trade him, I guess. 
I guess good for them for for riding it out. But uh, we'll see. We'll see if it continues. I, like I just wanted to say, I'm warning everybody right now. <laughs> I did it. on more teams. So if it if it ends, it is my fault, and I apologize in advance for that. Uh, we're gonna head out on our way out the door. A reminder: you can get a subscription to the Athletic for two dollars a month for the first year at theathletic.com/slash rates and barrels. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find the pod at rates and barrels. And again, you can join the Discord using the link in the show description. That's oh, one it. last thing. Uh, I'm going to be at the Saber Seminar on Friday. I'll, I'll, I'll tell it at a different time in a different podcast, but I'm going to have to say it a couple of times. I'm going to be at Saber Seminar this weekend in Chicago. Uh, Friday night, this Friday night, we're going to do a meetup at the Beer Temple. Uh, six o'clock, Beer Temple, Chicago, this Friday. Be there, be there, be there. Thanks for listening.